Oare el tira su naroi, su naroi en ti. Oare el tira su naroi, su naroi en ti. Oare el tira su naroi, su naroi en ti. Oare el tira su naroi, su naroi en ti. Oare el tira su naroi, su naroi en ti. Oare el tira su naroi, su naroi en ti. Oare el tira su naroi, su naroi en ti. Hello, welcome to the fifth episode of the Mango TV podcast. Today I'm proud to have Matteo Norzi. Matteo is an artist, designer, filmmaker, and indigenous rights activist. His explorative artistic practice took him through several extensive journeys along six continents. His art has been supported by important and prestigious institutions. His critically acclaimed directorial debut, the feature film Icaros, A Vision, co-directed with Leonor Caraballo, premiered in competition at the 2016 Tribeca Film Festival. Bringing with him years of personal experience and extensive research on Amazonian history and culture, Matteo is co-founder and currently serving as the executive director of the Shipi Boconibo Center. Welcome, Matteo. Ciao, Giancarlo. So let's uh, jump straight in about uh, Icaros. Um, give us a little bit um, the background, uh, how did the movie came about, uh, etc. Look, uh, Icaros uh, is a big piece of my life and the life of um, some friends of mine, in particular Leonor Caraballo and Abu Farman. Um, the film was uh, started with a personal experience in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, Leonor uh, asked me to go with her to drink ayahuasca and during the very first uh, two weeks uh, we decided we were, we were going to left everything that we were doing at the time and start working on the idea of the film. So that took us uh, into a long journey all the way to the border between uh, the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. Tell us a little bit the situation with Eleanor. So the, um, I, I hope that who's listening to us um, for this segment as watched the documentary. So um, tell us a little bit the situation with, the, with your co-director. My co-director, Leonor, uh, like myself, was uh, an artist. From, uh, she was from Argentina, I'm, I'm Italian. And we were both trying to make it in New York with the impression of uh, chasing the rabbit, but never, uh, we were never gonna catch it. So. She, we were a bit uh, unsettled with our life and we went to Peru to do ayahuasca. So in the beginning was, uh, was that. And during the, one of the first uh, ayahuasca experiences, Leonor had a vision of, of her dying. And after that, you know, she came back to New York and did some uh, tests and exams and uh, basically a previous uh, cancer that she had at the breast had uh, already spread throughout the body. So. Uh, as I was saying before, we were like committed to start uh, working on the production of the film and all of a sudden we had uh, very little time left. So Icarus became uh, a, a piece of work like there was no tomorrow because there was no tomorrow. So we started like selling properties and, and putting all our uh, money and everything all of our time into writing the film first and then uh, shooting. So obviously the, the lady in the movie who has a breast cancer was inspired by, by the situation. Yeah, our main character is called uh, Pasajera Angelina. Angelina, is, she's named after Angelina Jolie because in the, in the same time that Leo had to do a double mastectomy to get rid of her uh, risks or, or, or for the cancer to come back and everybody was like, uh, telling her that she was crazy, Angelina Jolie went public uh, that uh, she was doing the same uh, uh, operation, and so we decided to honor uh, this um, this um, uh, going out with this uh, position, and we called the character Angelina. Well, I imagine you know I know a little bit how difficult and what kind of pressure filmmakers have to you know to to finish a moving time and and being on budget and having this extra deadline must have been quite stressful yeah the shoot in the amazon was crazy for just because of the environment you know and the difficulties of uh, bringing about a production in the in the very location in which uh, fitzcarraldo was shot so but you know 
the fact that uh, there was uh, a very high stake for with Leonor uh, being in that situation, you know, with pain at the end of the shooting day, you know, that gave uh, the courage to everybody to to push through the production. And also thanks to the great uh, talent and courage of uh, our producer Abu Farman, we were able to pull it off. Yes, amazing. And also for, uh, Abu was uh, romantically linked with the director. So it was a quite um, emotionally heavy situation. And and so tell us a little bit how how you felt about you know shooting with the Shipibo and maybe also for our listener give us a little bit of context who are they who is this tribe that now is becoming so well known so the Shipibo are uh, the second biggest indigenous group of Peru so you know uh, they are a Panon speaking group so some of their cousins also are in Colombia and uh, in Brazil it's a, it's a large group with a long history you know formerly they were matriarchal societies and and that kind of uh, let's say a uh, way of living that challenges patriarchal model is what was so attracting to us. You know, Shipibo women are, are uh, the ones who hold knowledge both in terms of plant and, and shamanic practices. So, you know, our friendship uh, we, with, with them started from day one and we started uh, collaborating as an artist with these uh, other incredible artists. And uh, I, I like to say that as we were trying to direct the non-actor, the Shipibo on set, they were directing ourselves during the ceremony. Incredible, incredible. And so the title Icaros, Icaros are those songs that um, the indigenous sings. Tell us a little bit. Yeah, so the very reason why we went uh, in that location uh, to shoot the film is because we had to listen to this uh, Icaros, this song, you know, and we follow the music all the way to the source. So uh, it's a very particular kind of chant that um, it's said to be learned from the plant spirit. So, uh, and the film follows these uh, uh, ideas of a synesthetic construction. So the soundtrack of the film, in theory, is the one that uh, preceded uh, the visionary aspect, the visuals, uh, in, in every single phase of the, um, of the production. In, in the edit in particular, that our goal was to be able to have a self-standing uh, ceremony in the form of a soundtrack uh, prior to uh, being able to uh, edit the images into something that would make sense. Wow. But but so so the sound is also reflected in that in that calligraphy that we see in the documentary. Yes. So the Icaros are technologies. So and that's another uh, big uh, goal of the film is proving that uh, ayahuasca and this uh, and this uh, chants uh, alike cinema and video games and uh, you know also other uh, vision making uh, devices uh, are uh, on the same level uh, as technology to generate different ways of seeing. So the, the counterpart of the Icaros is called Kene. It, it is a, a very particular kind of abstract painting that um, uh, generates itself uh, in a fractal way. So it has a mathematical uh, attributes and geometrical attributes as well. I, 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 it's a kind of like a horror vacui uh, spirit. It's kind of like a, a colony of some sort of fungus that needs to spread over the the surface of the of the design field why so when you see this beautiful shipibo painting fabrics with those that calligraphy it's like an alphabet yeah it's a, it's like a language it doesn't go all the way to becoming a, a language made of words and letters but uh, it's nevertheless uh, kind of like the operating system of consciousness uh, at some level so it's kind of like a even if you do not understand what the, the signs mean in terms of a translation, they can uh, have an effect on you. So uh, sh the Shipibo believe that uh, some illness are caused by patterns that lost their order. And so the work of the shaman is to unravel those and replace them with the uh, uh, orderly ones. But so since you mentioned the word consciousness, this is a big topic for um, contemporary physicists and quantum mechanics and theologists. And they call it the hard problem in, in science is um, this idea that is consciousness just the epiphenomenon of the brain or is something cosmic that comes from we don't know where. 
What, what's your view on that? Look, I'm going to tell what, what the she people told me, you know, because they have a very clear view about this. It's what I call a spiritual understanding of ecology or a spiritual understanding of, of cosmology. So, you know, there is a word in she people that is called Kano, which means basically uh, intention, but also it's used uh, to express the concept of force in, in terms of a force of physics. It's the place of the river in which the current is the strongest. Uh, so it is uh, um, the direction in which a plant is trying to grow the roots. Uh, uh, so basically, by using the same concept to describe f gravity, for example, the attraction in between two planets and the attraction in between two people that fall in love with one another, or like the attraction of somebody who wants to, like the, the, the urge that somebody has to rebel against uh, oppressive system so using the same word they extend uh, uh, sp consciousness to everything they see so the force of gravity has an intention therefore has a, has a has a a personhood the river has a direction and the, therefore has personhood and and this is an important concept because uh, uh, recognizing uh, uh, the right to personhood uh, 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 to natural elements is one of the best venue to uh, protect the environment around us. So you use the word personhood as a synonymous of consciousness? Yeah, in that sense uh, I do. Uh, so the she people believe that uh, they call this, uh, anthropologists call this uh, idea Amazonian uh, prospectivism. They believe that even birds see themselves as human do uh, is they just have a different uh, disguise that they wear. So, but uh, every single uh, element of nature, whether it's plant, animal, or uh, river, or mineral, each one of these uh, realms is uh, made of the same shared uh, spiritual matter. And then there, there are hierarchies, so some are more powerful than others, but uh, the, the spiritual matter is shared throughout the universe. Interesting. It's like the animist religion. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It, it, is, uh, it is definitely, despite uh, 500 years of Christianity and stigmatization, Shipibo animism survived, and that's why I think uh, the Shipibo are so interesting, and that's why also the, I think their knowledge is could be of great help to the indigenous movements in, uh, throughout the world. Because today, more than ever, we need to find um, an understanding of our connection with nature that, that, that changed, the, the, that changed the, the relationship from an extractive to a more regenerative principle. C correct. Look, I, I, I grew up... Uh, uh, monotheist uh, with a J Jewish father and, and a Christian mother, but you know the dogma of one God was never uh, uh, possible in my in my childhood. And and then the, f the first day I drank ayahuasca, I realized that yeah, maybe there is a, do a God that is strongest than everybody else, but uh, the idea there is only one is a straight up lie. You know, uh, spirituality is made of uh, uh, multiplicity by definition. So I think an approach that uh, recognize uh, men as part of nature instead of uh, uh, men with the right over uh, nature is the, a very good first step towards uh, uh, the healing of uh, the environment in this moment of climate catastrophes. And also understanding that there is an intelligence which cannot be in a way outsmarted the the way materialist scientific, scientific materialist approach tries sometimes to shortcut nature in in some sort of linear solution like pesticide or fertilizer or i think about um, this idea that you know thinking to expand production with monoculture it just doesn't work because monoculture is not part of nature so you create this incredible, vast monoculture crop that then are not natural, cannot take care of themselves, and then you need the pesticide, and then you deplete the microorganism, which then deplete the nutritional values, that then deplete the microbiota, that then deplete the autoimmune system, and then we have a chronic disease epidemic in the world. Yeah, I th I'm totally with you on that. And I, I think, uh, uh, you know, the critic to uh, reductionism, here is the most relevant uh, 
uh, of all because uh, you know by embracing a view of the world that uh, uh, tries to cope with complexity instead of uh, breaking it down in parts i think is the only way forward in this moment so that's why i talk about the contemporaneity of indigenous wisdom so i don't look about i don't look uh, uh, towards the past I'm, I'm looking forward to the future and how for example this uh, in, uh, indigenous uh, uh, understanding of ecology that uh, uh, gives person to all these different things how that can inform for example the artificial intelligence systems that are gonna try to cope with uh, uh, geoengineering to save uh, uh, you know the world from uh, a very fast uh, uh, catastrophes can you elaborate on that that was a little bit of a complicated concept so basically you know many people now say that uh, uh, we already passed uh, the the situation of, of non going back with the, the changes that we uh, the point of no return yeah the point of no return and one of the solutions that uh, you know the people who believe in technology embrace is called geoengineering it means trying to manage macro ecological systems like i don't know at the size of uh, continental size in order to be able to correct uh, things like the the stream uh, of the mexico gulf that warms up europe you know this like kind of like macro phenomenon of the earth so i don't know if that is going to be ever be possible but what i do know that it won't be possible if this uh, AI system who are going to run these complexities are uh, uh, operated with a capitalistic mind view, uh, you know. Uh, instead, if they are informed with the uh, uh, concept of uh, reciprocity uh, and, and kinship protocols that extend to also animal, uh, plant and water, for example, I think we might have a framework uh, to um change uh, the direction that we are uh, heading to yeah that's why i you know i i call this uh, an ai shaman you know so uh, uh, by the, sa the same work that can be done you know to heal uh, ourselves from uh, you know traumas and and addictions and uh, you know whatever you can use ayahuasca to heal yourself i think this can be scaled up and indigenous uh, life ways uh, adapted to contemporary time, they can have probably an impact uh, on how and the world is gonna is gonna look like in the next uh, years and centuries. Yes, very interesting, and it's um, it's such a pity that you know we keep on hearing about destruction of of their habitat, and uh, maybe at the end towards the you know conclusion remark. We're going to um, ask for help. I know you're doing a fundraising campaign because um, the deforestation continues. Yeah, I want to say something because it, I, it continues the parallel in between personal healing and ecological healing. You know, now the first driver of deforestation in the Peruvian Amazon is uh, cocaine. So, and how many of us uh, used ayahuasca to try to cut the addiction with cocaine? So, I, I think once again, we see that there is a, a, cor a, a mirroring at, uh, at different levels of, of, of uh, existence. So, um, I promised we would talk um, about the documentary, but then we end up in, the, in system theory quite fast. Uh, let's maybe go back to the, the, the movie experience. How was writing the script? How was the other character, like the Italian actor with, with the um, speaking impairment, how, how was those character inspired by? So, first of all, I want to say that the film is not strictly a documentary, but it is a document. It is a document about a, a, a moment in time in which many people started going to the Amazon to find healing with ayahuasca and plant medicine in general. So, the, the film was uh, the project of the film started in 2011. You know, and you know, you guys interviewed before uh, uh, Daniel Pinchbeck, who uh, probably is one of those who captured. Uh, uh, that that moment uh, 
uh, before anybody else. So with this book, yeah, uh, breaking the head open, exactly, and also with the uh, 2012, uh, you know, like bringing attention to uh, indigenous prophecies and and uh, different ways of uh, of uh, finding healing and uh, different ways of, of judging uh, shamanic practices. So we were exactly in that moment when we started with the film, and and then we. The time became something uh, in, in which I, now I, I lose uh, awareness because, you know, the work on the film never stopped from the writing. The writing was uh, us traveling to the Amazon, you know, so we, the film was written in uh, hotels and lodges in the Amazon until when it was written in the waiting room of the hospital because the condition of my co-director and co-writer changed so much that she could not longer uh, easily travel so you know but even the drama of uh, the tragedy of uh, having uh, the inevitability of uh, of a disease that is uh, taking over you we decided to use that uh, in a creative way so we we kind of like incorporate those uh, moments of reality in uh, in the character so each one of the characters to go back to your question each one of the characters is actually playing himself or herself you know the, the the shamans are all shamans you know the the wife of of the young shaman is uh, really his wife and the, the daughter is really his daughter and filippo timi the italian actor with a speech impediment really had an, uh, a speech impediment that uh, kind of like uh, compromised or, or at least affected uh, part of his career as an, a, as an actor and so he, he joined the production yes to play a role but also with the hope of uh, solving uh, the issue so he was drinking ayahuasca for real yeah all the actors were actually invited if not forced <laughs> to to drink ayahuasca for real in front of the camera most of the of the of the footage in which uh, uh, they are really under the effect of ayahuasca we did not use you know, in, in the final cut of the film, but the soundscape and the sound of the ceremonies and, you know, and the rumors of people throwing up and, 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 and crying, those are actually completely uh, capturing uh, the reality of the moment of the experience of the actors in the Maloca. Wow, wow. And, and, and what about Arturo losing his sight? That was also true? Arturo had an eye problem that uh, was uh, uh, solved, so he's still uh, he's not blind now. But uh, so that was a, a little push to have a, a stronger uh, um, storyline for him. Uh, but what is it? What is true that uh, by taking Arturo to the eye doctor, you know, uh, during our very first uh, uh, week uh, in in the Amazon, we opened a channel of communication. So we took him to the eye doctor to check his eyes because he really had a, a, a bad conjunctivitis, and then he kind of like opened the door for special care uh, in the Maloca, and also took us then to his community. Uh, and, and and so we were able to follow him uh, home and understand more about uh, the life way of of his people. Amazing. And um, all the um, conceptual artistic effect there was. It seems to 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 see if I remember correctly. They were like like body part pulsating and breathing. They were like like an X ray that remind me of a uh, echographia. There was uh, the labyrinth, the, the, the incredible. So that was inspired by your background of, of, of an artist. Yeah, everybody, the, from the producer to the directors, everybody had a, a, a past career in the contemporary art world. So, and this film really signified also a way to free ourselves from the bonds uh, of, the, of the space of the gallery and the frustration of, of, of never being able to really to uh, come on top of the pyramid of, of the art world. But uh, going back to those images, those are uh, also the real MRIs of Leo, you know, detecting her own cancer. And I was trying to say, you know, as, uh, you know, the, the cancer were emerging in her bones, you know, she was the kind of per person who was uh, already thinking about how to make an animation with those, you know. So uh, it, was a, it was a way, I instead of waiting uh, for her fate, to come and take her away, she took every single moment of the experience to create. And that's, uh, you know, that's why also the work that we are doing now as uh, indigenous rights activists, you know, after uh, the film is uh, an afterlife project because, you know, we, we 
uh, are trying to continue the collaboration and continue the collaboration in the spirit of uh, not worrying too much about oneself, but uh, in the spirit of giving everything that we can to uh, heal uh, uh, others, in, in this case, indigenous people. Amazing, amazing. So I strongly recommend to watch this, doc, this, this film. Um, for those of us who drank ayahuasca a lot, we'll have a, really an activation with the music and the image you, you feel, you will feel the activation. For those that didn't try, they will enjoy it anyway. Um, you can find it on Mango TV, the, the movie. And um, thank you, Matteo, for uh, discussing the film with us. Thank you, Giancarlo. I wish this was in Italian, but we are here speaking in English, so I, I apologize for my bad accent. Your ac Italian accent is nothing to apologize for my Italian accent. I think it's a, it's a, it's a plus. Okay, so um, moving on to another part of your life, which I found extremely interesting, is um, you are the Shipibo ambassador in America or in the world. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. So, ag again, after making the film, we realized that even uh, a film is a form of extractivism. You know, we went there, we took the images and we, bring, uh, we brought them to the world. Uh, and then at the moment of the uh, of the opening night at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2016, you know, we realized that uh, the United States of America were not willing to grant visas to our actors to join the celebration. So, you know, that uh, is just an, an example of a, of, a, of a larger issue of like a, a very unbalanced relationship that uh, uh, spiritual tourism is uh, imposing over indigenous population. For example, you know, uh, nowadays shamans make so much more money healing the, the, the foreigners that they don't have no longer uh, time to serve their communities and therefore the communities are left without healthcare providers. Just to make an example. So we decided back then to continue our work in this field by establishing a non-profit organization that is called the Shipibo Conibo Center and has uh, its uh, headquarters in Harlem, in West Harlem here in New York, and uh, serves uh, as uh, an indigenous nation's embassy, like you were saying. So we do host uh, indigenous artists, activists, and healers when they need to come to New York for the U United Nations Permanent Forum or other international events. But then most of our work take place in the Amazon. In the Amazon, we are trying to pilot uh, a way of doing conservation and uh, fighting deforestation that is uh, uh, by empowering indigenous uh, uh, people and their uh, representative organizations. It's being uh, shown by plenty of studies that the indigenous lands have the lowest level of deforestation even compared to nat national parks and private sanctuaries. So it's easy to see on the map, you know, wherever there is green in your uh, uh, planet on, on Google Earth, that's probably where indigenous people are. So, so now we are trying to basically uh, empower uh, the representative organizations of the, of the Shipibo people towards um, taking over the responsibility of a conservation of, of their territory. Do they have the title for the land? Look, P Peru recognize, uh, and I go back talking about personhood, uh, or or, uh, recognize legal personhood only at the level of the community. So, and that it's an important thing, and it's being uh, the fight for titling, it's been uh, the goal of the federations for, for many years. But nevertheless, now we realize also that it's a form of parceling. You know, instead of uh, being able to unify under the banner of an indigenous nation, we are, uh, the Shipibo are forced into having all these uh, little satellites in a very dispersed territory. So what we are trying to say here is that we, it's important to bring together all these uh, 176 Shipibo communities and uh, coordinate their uh, governance and coordinate their uh, ecological management and, and that kind of coordination becomes an indigenous nation. In order to 
protect the land. In order to protect the land, for example, when there is a logger company that approaches a community and often bribes or find a way in to cut the, 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 the only trees that are left, the community 50 kilometers downstream doesn't even get to know about this. And so next year is their own turn. So what we did is, for example, support an indigenous radio that in Shipibo informs the communities about environmental uh, uh, invasions. Threat, yeah. Or we have a legal program that uh, free of charge accepts uh, the, the request of the variant communities when they need to uh, um, file a legal action against uh, one of these uh, invasions. We are also helping establishing a set of co-ops, of cooperatives, so to offer the communities who, for example, produce non-timber forest products or, or fruits from the jungle to have a direct fair market in Lima without being uh, squeezed by the middlemen uh, along the way. So by bringing together these different communities under uh, uh, organizing bodies, we are in, in very few years we were able to create uh, tangible results in terms of resisting deforestation. So re the resisting deforestation and protecting the land is probably objective number one. Then objective number two might, might probably be to try to export this body of knowledge um, you know we have a common friend Geronimo whose um, job definition is to imagine how the use of these plants look like outside their um, place of origin. And the one of the typical misconceptions is everybody focus on ayahuasca, who's now, who's now very well known, but as you see on, on, your, on your film, the idea is that all these plants have therapeutic power and the shaman can recommend the right one, and it's, it's this science called vegetalismo and you see in your film that ev all the dif the, pa the passenger all the different passenger have different medicine so um, how how are you guys try to inform the rest of the world that um, this is a culture that needs to be maybe taken and consumed in in the in the right context with the right shaman w okay what i'm trying to ask you is how do you see this plants traveling to uh, Europe, to America? How, what do you think about this phenomenon of neo-shamanism, of non-indigenous shaman? What do you think about that? Look, it's a complex topic. The reality is that my focus is introspective, and so I don't really... Uh, I do also advocacy, and uh, I'm involved in uh, reaching out to the rest of the world, so I'm going to try to address your question as well. But the real focus of, of our work is... Uh, in Peru, and not only in Peru, also within ourselves, in, uh, introspectively. So we are trying to uh, understand this, uh, this knowledge system in a way that uh, uh, self-serve, you know, the practitioners. I make an example about this. You know, our uh, is a philanthropic uh, um, enterprise. You know, we, we, we are doing philanthropic work in Peru, but we don't do that uh, by convincing the West uh, uh, of uh, uh, begging for money, at least we, we also do crowdfunding campaign, but the core of our work is financed by dealing with Shipibo art, so which is a, a, qu a quite unique uh, framework in the sense that by uh, offering stage to uh, the very particular cultural diversity of the Shipibo, we are able also to finance uh, the operations that uh, 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 need to be financed to protect the environment. So this, this is a, a way to answer to your question. But then, then I go back to the idea of uh, looking, uh, zooming out and see w w the journey of these plants to the world. And uh, it's definitely important to remember this, not ju just ayahuasca like you are saying, but it is a complex, uh, medical system that uh, for years was able to provide solution not only for mental health but also for uh, any kind of problems in the body including uh, orthopedics so uh, uh, for example part of my work now is studying uh, shipibo uh, midwifery the midwife uh, since uh, there is a the, the shipibo said the, the blood and ayahuasca they clash 
uh, wherever there is blood, like in giving birth, that there is a, a contact with, with blood, there is a whole other uh, range of plants they do not clash with, uh, with, with blood, the, they, they are used by the, the midwives for many different reasons. So it's important to understand that we do not need to break down again uh, in a reductionist way the medical system, but we need to try to understand it in a way in which bodies, minds, territories, plants are all part of the same thing. And then I go back to the idea of uh, um, extraction so i already answered to how i see this i see that the world is uh, extracting knowledge and is uh, using these plants for uh, healing themselves and in 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 the case of the the us it's is is very clear in, in which the path towards medicalization is once again leaving out indigenous practitioners not only because they are not involved in the medical studies but also because many indigenous uh, uh, First Nations uh, um, reserves, they do not have any longer access to the very plants that the West is trying to exploit. You know, in the case of, of New Mexico, this is like evident, for example, with peyote, you know, and how this is being informing uh, psychedelic medicine for a while, but the, the, the people there are struggling with alcoholism and poverty. So, Again, I think we should uh, stop focusing on healing ourselves and trying also to embrace a, a more holistic way in which the healing of our own bodies comes with uh, a work of reciprocity towards the indigenous people that provided these knowledges. To yes, people. because if I may, I, I think that the, you know, there's just a different approach between Western medicine, which is more reductionist and more oriented to to treat the symptoms, and also the way it is organized with, with grant, it becomes very uh, linear in, 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 in determining the right um, therapy for the right pathology, whereas the, the indigenous approach is a more holistic art of living, really. Yeah, imagine that the people believe that when you are sick, the whole community needs to uh, partake to the ceremony, so it becomes a, a collective uh, uh, treatment. You know, that, you know, as we discuss if uh, uh, healthcare is a right or a privilege, you know, the Shipibo sees it as a duty and as a collective interest, you know. You need to cure the individual for the good of the community. So some of these ideas, I think they could be adapted and uh, adopted uh, in uh, elsewhere in order to improve the way that we uh, collectively uh, take care of uh, of yes, public health yes. and uh, you know i'm i'm dabbling a little bit with permaculture as you know in ibiza and you know I, I've, I've been seeing with my eyes to what extent the ecosystem is resilient and regenerative if you let if you don't interfere if you let you know the the, the plant helping each other you really see that you know underground on the chemical level there is like a, a concert of collaboration. So um, I think that that's what inspired the Shipibo in things like you know all the community needs to be present in a ceremony to heal a member of the community. There is this this connectivity which we have lost in the, in the West. Um, and and then I don't know if you can talk about it. Um, there is a new project now in Peru. There is a new land that you guys might uh, collaborate with, and maybe have a center there. It's yeah, it's, uh, it's it's all starting now. But uh, we we were donated uh, an incredible piece of land, and uh, we are exploring uh, the idea of creating an institute that is going to bring together uh, um, plant medicine, uh, indigenous politics, and art. You know, as a an educational. Uh, um, organization uh, and uh, it's gonna be a way to uh, experiment with a new way of uh, thinking about conservation even uh, within the uh, Peruvian legal framework by bringing together indigenous sovereignty with conservation so right now these two uh, realm are completely separate in the in the in the legal understanding of, of Peru so you can have a, a natural park sometimes overlaps but usually it's in conflict with the interest of an indigenous title land so we want to basically experiment 
a, a new model in which indigenous people take responsibility of conservation and uh, and therefore they are recognized with the full uh, titling of the land so this is going to be kind of the mission of of the institute and then you know the other mission is to bring together um art with uh, and politics with uh, uh, visionary practices because uh, you know now there is also a kind of a division is happening you know much of shipibo art is victim of folklorization and many of the artists do not take the plants and so they are kind of just repeating uh, the patterns without uh, a first person experience so part of the idea of the institute is also to bring back together visionary practices with uh, the visual renditions that uh, are uh, the, the goal of the artist and also by doing that uh, taking care of uh, a wider form of healing that extend to the territorial dimension and what politics has to do with all that Because indigenous politics, uh, you know, organizing uh, indigenous groups and uh, uh, being able to interface with the Peruvian state, uh, so to have a level of autonomies that are comparable to the regional body of governance or the municipal body of governance. So we are trying to have uh, indigenous nations having autonomy and protections because, uh, uh, unfortunately, corruption Uh, place at every level of the state in Peru. So, you know, uh, being able to have a, a, a regime of autonomy is is one of the goals of the Shipibo uh, uh, body, uh, representative bodies. Yeah, very interesting. I'm, th I'm thinking if there is the possibility to invite, um, you know, school teachers and educators from around the world to learn a little bit this basic principle of shamanic principle of integrating with nature and and export that in the in the school worldwide yeah the, the the goal is that one so we were thinking to do a summer school you know in which uh, western uh, students have the chance to uh, learn about uh, uh, these these topics uh, uh, on site by inviting also academics from all over the world and then for the rest of the year have the institution dedicated to intergenerational transmission of knowledge to shipibo apprentices and also becoming a school for future leaders you know like the, the, that's why you know we, we focus on politics we need to build the next generation of um lawyers and leaders in order to for the people to take take uh, the handle of their destiny to their yeah to protect their culture absolutely It's so interesting you know maybe in the future there will be you know how now there is i don't know silicon valley tech entrepreneur that goes around doing talks about scalability um we can have then you know she people educator going around teaching people about um integration with nature. So this is very interesting. Congratulations for all your work that you do. What about in terms of your creative life? Uh, what's the next, uh, are you working on a, on a new book or a new movie or a new piece of art? Look, I want to first, uh, before talking about me, because I always say this is not about me. So I want to talk about uh, a, a great uh, uh, news. It's uh, Sara Flores, a Shipibo artist who is opening her uh, first solo show at White Cube in London on November 26. So we are focusing uh, on uh, this incredible uh, uh, opportunity that, uh, you know, I want to thank Giancarlo because he was part of making this, uh, this uh, a reality. So that is going to be the next step. And then, you know, uh, following the wave of this, uh, uh, let's say, incorporation of the contemporary art world uh, with indigenous artists, we are also working for uh, Uh, providing a similar uh, stage to other Shipibo artists here in New York. So uh, follow us on our website and you will, you, you will receive uh, information about the next shows in New York as well. And then myself, in terms of something that is more of uh, my uh, authorship, I'm writing a film that is, uh, tries to uh, bring together all these things that we've been talking about from... Uh, AI shamanism to uh, the need of uh, understanding uh, ecology uh, under a spiritual perspective and how these things can uh, help the Shipibo and possibly also help other movements who are experimenting against neoliberal systems.
what can be the alternative to neoliberal system? I don't know. I, I mean, this work of an activist needs to be seen long term. You know, if if you otherwise you 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 don't find the energy to wake up in the morning because we are we are losing ground. You know, and when you try to defend indigenous land, you see that uh, uh, exactly how it is in which you know capitalistic society bites a piece more every day of, of your territory. So, you know, the, uh, you know, the problem of, of capitalism and colonialism are very evident when you, when you are trying to defend indigenous land. So I don't know if we will ever be able to do anything that is uh, significant in this, uh, in this, uh, tr uh, in this um, attempt to resist uh, neoliberalism. But what we, we do are, what we, we can do is... Uh, experiment an alternative way of living you know community or a, a portion of land in, in the middle of the amazon is trying to do something different and maybe you know after uh, the cataclysm you know our ex little experiment or maybe the experiment of somebody else that is doing something similar is gonna inspire the, a, a new uh, way of uh, creating society so you know in the end the idea is to keep the flame of the spirit uh, uh, alight and and uh, and then see what the destiny is bringing us yeah that's very interesting and also in ibiza there is um you know a very strong uh, movement for um, the regeneration of the land so this is a concept that now is very clear that you know you want to use principle of biodiversity to regenerate the land but what is also starting very slowly is this idea that, okay, you are an entrepreneur, you rent some land, you uh, hire a farmer, and you do regenerative principle, and you do regenerate the land. But then the question is, do you have a regenerative relationship with the landowner and the farmer? And the answer is no, because, you know, the farmer gets a salary and the owner gets a rental, but there is nothing regenerative about that relationship. So one of my personal projects, we are developing a documentary podcast, which is maybe, I don't know, 10 episodes, going in depth of this idea of regeneration and try to explore alternative system of, of business relationship that are regenerative. So we're looking at things like cooperative, where the people involved are co-owner, where there is an alignment of interest. And what I feel is really happening in Ibiza which is a great laboratory for regeneration, is really the development of a regenerative lifestyle. So, you know, practice of, of course, practice of self-development, practice of awareness, practice of localization. It's, um, it's, it's, it's very, you know, inspiring and, um, and um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, what's the right word I'm looking for? It's uh, encouraging. Yeah, I'm really glad that you are working in this direction and I, I, I admire you for doing this because I think, again, even Ibiza can be a, a pilot for something and then maybe one day it's going to become uh, uh, more relevant in, uh, you know, throughout uh, a, la a larger uh, territory. The same we are doing uh, with the Shipibos. For example, we are uh, trying to uh, use uh, non-timber forest products. I'm talking about saps and leaves and fruit of the jungle and... Uh, and different plants that uh, uh, the Shipibo uh, hold knowledge about to prove that they have more value than the monocrops or the logs that the jungles are destroyed for. So I think the goal, again, I was trying to, 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 to go against neoliberalism, but here I'm, I'm contradicting myself because I think it's also possible to align an economical interest with a regenerative, a regenerative interest. You know, it's possible to defend the jungle by, instead of exploiting it by cutting down the trees, by knowing the value of the medicinal and cosmetic plants with a, a million of applications that is possible to um, use without harming. So in that sense, there is, there is a way to improve at every level. It's, it's important to degrow and consume less but it's also important to wherever we consume consume in a way that uh, is uh, sustainable very good so thank you very much we've been together 15 minutes um you know you said that you admire me but i admire you more <laughs> 
because I think that you are really mixing, you know, your incredible creativity and talent as an artist with the passion of an activist and with the heart of a shamanic indigenous person. Um, for people that want to know more, you mentioned that um, they can check on the website if, um, if and when there is a Shipibo artist show in New York. W w which website were you? Um, my website is shipiboconibo.org. So it's Shipibo Conibo Center. Just put it on Google, it's going to pop up. And uh, it's an art project in the shape of a, a non profit organization. And, and uh, we are open uh, under appointment, uh, by appointment only during uh, co this COVID time. But I, I welcome everybody to reach out and come and have a tea with us. Ami amazing. And, um, y y and uh, we're going to publish this podcast probably in a couple of weeks. Um, how long is your GoFundMe campaign? Yeah, we just started the GoFundMe. It's going to be open-ended for a year. We are trying to support uh, Guardia Indigenas, which means indigenous pa patrols. So it's kind of a, an army of women, kids, and men that uh, is uh, uh, walking around uh, the indigenous territory in order to provide uh, uh, alert for land invasion. So it's a very simple system. You know, We hope to be able to incorporate also drones and uh, boats and uh, and uh, other uh, other ways to uh, to make it faster but for now is uh, really uh, just people uh, walking around their territory and whenever there is an invasion you know with a, a, an uh, an alert system they can file in uh, legal action legal actions call in uh, uh, other bodies to intervene so uh, please uh, uh, consider supporting Shipibo Guardia Indigenas because it's a, a very good way to protect indigenous territory uh, in a moment in which uh, cocaine-driven uh, deforestation is uh, taking on. Taking and so on. how do they find the GoFundMe campaign? The GoFundMe is on, on, the, uh, on the homepage of uh, our, our website, shipiboconibo.org, uh, and maybe we can uh, put the link uh, at, at the end of the podcast. Of course, we're going to put all these relevant, relevant links. And um, thank you, Matteo, for giving us your time. And um, looking forward to speak in the near future about more of your project and how they're all going. Thank you for coming. Grazie, Giancarlo. Coca sonara e sonara enti Coca sonara e sonara enti Coca sonara e sonara enti